I will never be awake past midnight again. I have a habit of staying on my cell phone after 11 o'clock reading creepy passes and listening to horror podcasts. They rarely scare me, but they do fill my mind with unrealistic scenarios of entities, monsters and murders. One Saturday night, when the whole neighborhood was already quiet and I was the only person awake, I was brushing my teeth in the bathroom with my back to the dark corridor, listening to a horror story through my headphones. Suddenly, I heard a noise of something falling behind me. Quickly paused the story and looked back. Nothing, just the empty corridor, illuminated by the light from the bathroom. So I decided to go out and look in the direction where the noise seemed to have come from, my bedroom. I went into it and turned on the light. I wasn't scared, just worried that something had fallen and broken in there, but everything was normal so I thought it was just my head or the story, and went back to doing what I was doing. When I finished, I went back to my room and put on my pajamas to go to bed. It was very late, I'd spent all night listening to horror podcasts while playing games, so I was quite sleepy, until I noticed that the window was wide open, something that surprised me for a few seconds because I didn't remember opening the window. Well, since it was so hot, Maybe I should have done it earlier and I didn't remember. I put on my pajamas, turned off the light, and went to bed. I scrolled through my social media feed for a few minutes before putting my cell phone on charge and turning it off. Then I woke up out of nowhere with a panicky feeling taking over my body. I quickly opened my eyes and a feeling of dread gripped my body as I looked towards the entrance to my room and saw a dark figure with only a white face, standing there and staring at me. My heart raced wildly, almost as if it was going to explode. The thing walked towards me and the door closed on its own behind it, without the thing even putting its hand on it. Then the thing stops next to me and stares at me with those black orbs. On closer inspection. The creature must have been hooded, and looked more human, and its white face looked more like a mask now. I felt sweat beating on my forehead. Then something clicked in my mind. I remembered the stories I used to read, and how they filled my mind. It could only be a sleep paralysis, and the thing must have been an amalgam of everything I'd been imagining all day. And then, in the midst of the excitement caused by my relief. I abruptly moved my arm and leg, and the thing was still there. That's when I realized that I wasn't in sleep paralysis. I've been a trucker for years, traveling the long halls between Portland and Fairbanks regularly. It's a journey that has become second nature to me. But on this particular night, things were different. The weather had taken a turn for the worse and the harsh winds and relentless snowfall made the road treacherous on top of the rocky roads in the Yukon of Canada. I knew I had to find a safe place to park and wait out the storm, but there were no rest stops or gas stations in sight. Just as the last light of day disappeared, I saw a faintly glowing sign pointing to a truck stop a few miles ahead. I felt a wave of relief wash over me as I turned onto the snow-covered road hoping to find shelter and a hot meal. The road seemed endless, and the darkness was all-encompassing. The snowfall made it hard to see anything ahead, and I had to navigate with caution. As I finally approached the truck stop, it appeared almost ghostly. A rundown and isolated place tucked deep within the Yukon wilderness. Only a couple of other trucks were parked there, adding to the eerie silence that surrounded the place. Upon entering the truck stop, I immediately sensed an unsettling atmosphere. The dim lighting and the musty smell made the place feel strangely haunting. The old man behind the counter acknowledged me with a nod, but there was something in his eyes that spoke of unspoken stories and experiences. Despite my gut feeling, I decided to grab a quick bite to eat and then huddle in my truck for the night. As the storm raged on outside, I struggled to find sleep. The noises of the storm seemed to take on a life of their own. Whispers carried by the wind, creaking sounds from the nearby woods, 
and eerie laughter that seemed to come from nowhere. Tried to dismiss these unsettling feelings as mere products of exhaustion, but as the night wore on, they only grew stronger. The radio became my lifeline, my connection to the outside world. Yet, all I heard were cryptic messages and distorted voices, making me feel even more isolated and on edge. As the clock neared midnight, just as I was starting to drift into a restless slumber, a tapping sound on my truck window jolted me awake. My heart raced as I peered outside, but the storm made it nearly impossible to see anything clearly. Tried to convince myself that it was just a tree branch or an animal seeking shelter. Then, a sudden flash of lightning illuminated the surroundings for a brief moment, and I saw a shadowy figure slowly walking by my truck. Fear gripped me, and I fumbled for my phone, desperate to call for help. But there was no signal, and the figure stopped about two feet away from the door, sending chills down my spine. To my horror, more ghostly silhouettes emerged from the darkness. Their glowing eyes and unnaturally fluid movements terrified me. I locked the doors, hoping to keep them at bay. With trembling hands, tried to start the engine and escape this nightmare. You know when somebody is running from danger in a horror film, and they get to a vehicle and the engine decides to stall out. Yeah, that happened to me here. I was trapped with these otherworldly beings pressing against the windows, their haunting faces close enough to touch. Faint whispers grew louder, filling the cab with an eerie presence. I grabbed a flashlight, hoping its beam could offer some protection. To my shock, I realized these apparitions were not human at all. They were something far darker and malevolent. It seemed like they thrived on fear. In a state of terror, I retreated to the bunk of the truck, clutching a wrench for any semblance of safety. I held on tight, praying for the storm to subside and the morning light to break the spell. Yet, the night felt interminable, and reality blurred with horrifying visions. As the first rays of dawn finally pierced the storm clouds, the ghostly figures retreated back into the forest, leaving no trace behind. The wind and snow subsided, and I mustered the courage to step out of my truck, my heart still pounding from the night's terrors. As I approached the truck stop, it was in ruins as if abandoned for years. The old man was nowhere to be found, and an eerie emptiness lingered. I couldn't explain what I had witnessed, but I knew I had to leave immediately. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that something malevolent lurked in the Yukon wilderness. I kept this harrowing experience to myself, fearing that others might dismiss it as a figment of my imagination. Yet deep within, I knew that something inexplicable and sinister had taken place on that fateful night in the Yukon. I vowed to never stop driving until I reached the safety of Fairbanks, leaving the haunting memories of that cursed truck stop behind me forever. Aaron was a bullshitter. Everyone in our class knew it. Even at the age of 10, you could see the wild imagination in his eyes writing his stories midway through telling them. His dad knew the president and his uncle was in the rocket that went to the moon, but he doesn't like having his photos taken so you won't recognize him from anywhere. It was fun not believing but indulging him. I spent every school year with him following that enjoyment, but there was something different in those eyes when he spoke about the Midnight Man lack of the imagination the rest of his tales required. He said he first saw him whilst disobeying his bedtime orders, glancing at the vacant sidewalk through his bedroom window. He's just like, weird. He has one of those big foreheads like Daniel's dad and one eyebrow that's as long as two. He wears a coat like mine, but it's black. Aaron gestured to his red cagoule and ignored Daniel's sulking that began after his dad's receding hairline got used as a description. I can sprint to your house in like 23 seconds and I never saw him. Daniel snarled at him. That's because you go to bed early. He only goes walking at nighttime 12. Like midnight. He must be the midnight man. Aaron blurted out at the surrounding gang, darting his eyes around to see if we all looked on board with his story. 
We all just stared in silence, which was the usual cue for him to continue. He didn't see me, but he stopped and was looking at my house. He had loads of rings on one hand like bikers have, but he didn't have a bike. My brother could have beat him up anyway since he was staying at our house and he was the strongest marine in his squadron and helped Obama kill Bin Laden. He says I'm already stronger than most of the guys he trained with. We all giggled and resorted back to the usual teasing that occurs whenever Aaron goes on such tangents, but I could tell we all shared the same curiosity about the Midnight Man. We all left the playground with the agreement that Aaron and Daniel would stay up until midnight to see if they both spot the Midnight Man. If not, Aaron had to be in goal when we played soccer during tomorrow's recess. You need to stay up too, Aaron pointed at me. Why do I have to stay up? Because he walks the same way me and Daniel did when we went to your mum's barbecue at your house. And if he breaks Daniel's door down and punches him to death with his biker rings, you need to tell everyone I was right. Daniel shot a look of mildly frustrated betrayal at his involuntary sacrifice. Fine, I said, and with that, we were all going home to look out for Aaron's midnight man. It took me a good minute just to get to my bedroom window from my bed. My mom and dad always went to bed late, and the plan was ruined if they knew I'd stayed up. I turned my own TV off when they told me to but kept my Xbox on so as soon as I pressed the television remote power button, my Xbox messages screen reappeared so I could talk to Aaron and Daniel. The sound was all the way down, so I quietly moved my analog stick to type a message from my windowsill, once the time read 23.55 p.m. Waiting now. I squatted down, so only my nose and above was visible from the street, and I stared into the night. Nothing moved but the gentle sway of tree branches and bushes in the summer breeze. I played Aaron's story back over in my head, and felt a faint burning of nerves in my stomach which slowly faded as the boredom set in. I was thinking about getting back in bed and messaging Aaron to tell him he's in goal tomorrow, by 05. Then I saw the glow of my TV shift as a message from XX, underscore Ninjaran, underscore, X came through. He's back. The nerds returned, but I reassured myself that Aaron isn't the one I need confirmation from. Daniel's message is the one that makes it real. I mentally noted that I'd give it until 020. The nerves weren't fading this time. It felt like I was checking the time every half an hour just to see it unchanged or only a minute later. I wish there was a way to hide even more of myself from the world outside the glass. I was begging to see Daniel's gamer tag pop up on my screen. I glanced back over at my TV, but before my brain could even register the time, I heard him. Faint but audible thud of shoes hitting the sidewalk was growing closer, bouncing around midnight silence. As I lowered my head further until I could barely see the street, I saw him. Aaron's description was uncanny. A tall man in all black marched past my house and began slowing in pace as he reached the path leading to our porch. His hands were in his pockets as his legs began moving too slowly to even propel him forward. He stared towards our front door then began scanning the garden, his movement matching a corpse's from the neck down. I kept my eyes fixed on his hands to try and catch a glimpse of his rings. By the time I went back to study his face, his emotionless gaze, shadowed by a thick mono brow was climbing up to my bedroom window. I lost my nerve and dropped out of sight, trying to keep my breathing quiet pleaded with the universe to end the peace I was happy to endure just minutes ago, until I heard the thud of his shoes continue and waited before slowly resuming my hidden stance by the windowsill. He was out of sight. All that was left to suggest he was even there in the first place was the faint swishing of a moving kegel sinking back into the soft wind and darkness. I stared out a few seconds longer until I was startled by a flicker of light coming from my muted TV. Danny B63 messaged. He's real and I think he saw me. Heron was cockily slumped in his chair like a king as Daniel told a group of kids what he saw when I got to class the next day. He's like that robot guy with the European accent in those movies my dad watches. 
He saw it too. Daniel pointed at me. Joined the excited rambling and watched my classmates' faces jump between terror and inframent as I described whoever it was that turned my warm summer night into an eerie horror intro. Some other boys said they were gonna start staying up for the midnight man too. The teacher ordered us all to our seats and before I could empty my pencil case, Daniel leaned over from his desk and spoke in a tone much more quiet and disturbed than the one he'd just been spitting all around the classroom. Did you see his monster eyes? Shook my head. It was like he was mad at us or something. The teacher's bellows began overpowering Daniel's whispers. Despite the giddiness the midnight man gave Aaron and Daniel, I had a strong urge to never force myself awake for such a reason again, an urge that was drowning in the certainty that as long as midnight returns, the man would too, and his visits wouldn't go without a witness. Some other boys began joining what we'd call hunting the midnight man night, despite said nights just being us hiding behind our curtains and windowsills. Most nights I wouldn't even stay up, I'd just say I did. I didn't like the feeling the midnight man gave me when I felt his presence near my home. That cold, pale face and those stiff strides made me feel a way nothing else of this world could. During spring break we'd all stay up late gaming together, and you felt the brink of tomorrow drop its shade of black when someone mentioned midnight approaching. We'd nervously joke through those distant thuds and that's all it became after a while. By the time we all started high school the mysterious and mythical became the homeless and slash or mentally ill. The midnight man became more of an inside joke we'd rarely make the effort to crack, let alone hunt. The only thing regarding him that remained unchanged over the years was the severity in which Daniel spoke about him with. Sometimes it felt like we were making jokes about God in front of a Christian. He never breached the subject but would go somber if anyone else did and would only speak to retell all his sightings of the Midnight Man without a shred of humor in his voice. Me and Aaron stayed pretty good friends, but we grew apart from Daniel. Maybe that was one of the reasons why. By the time we had reached 16 Daniel had moved across the country with his family. Something to do with his dad's job. Just remember fist bumping him on his last day and seeing his car go past my house as he drove away from the past 16 years of his life, leaving mine and Aaron's without him from that day forward. The Daniel we knew when we were 10 was nowhere to be found in the Daniel who drove down my road that day. I could tell Aaron was saddened by his leaving, because he'd constantly bring up old times and ask me to start my Xbox up again to play with him, a hobby I'd left behind once I hit 13. It now sat under my desk, gathering dust, probably with thousands of game invites from him and Daniel over the past three years, all unanswered. Mine and Aaron's friendship was never awkward, but like a lot of teenagers we just began meeting new friends and going to parties and hanging out without each other. There was always a seat for him next to me and vice versa, but time slowly turned him into a face I'd acknowledge whilst passing in the halls. We shared a hug when we both graduated high school and had a drunken, reminiscent talk at the after party where we brought up his bullshit stories from all those years ago, how we should both find our Xboxes again, the midnight man antics and where we think Daniel and other kids from our class had and would end up. That was the last time I spoke to Aaron. Ten years have passed now and despite the love I still have for him, I would happily accept that as the end of our story in exchange for eradicating the bubbling dread that has since nested within me. Unexpectedly lost my job two weeks ago and immediately made the decision to mentally tie myself to my desk with my laptop and phone in front of me, barely moving to eat or sleep, but regularly doing so to grab another beer and extinguish the anxiety regarding my next bill payment. Ad after ad, phone call after phone call. I began speaking in a mental script, only communicating to pursue a wage and begging fate to give me an opportunity. After two days, it must have been the 20th time I refreshed my email to see I'd received another automated chunk of text, stating my application was unsuccessful, and all the suppressed frustration since getting laid off left my body. 
I swiped my laptop and phone off of my desk counter, launched an empty bottle at the wall, and stormed out of the room to my bedroom. I opened the window, lit a cigarette, and inspected the night, wondering what the hell went so wrong so fast. I'd been bound to my desk so long that I didn't even realize it was dark out. I was watching the smoke disappear into the void of the sky when I looked down to see a man three stories below me walking past the small patch of grass just before the sidewalk outside my building. I watched in confusion as he slowly came to a halt and began examining the bricks. I saw his head freeze when it reached my window and I was in too bad of a mood to break the glare first. We stared at each other in silence and I raised the two fingers I was using to grip my cigarette to acknowledge his presence. He kept starring. I gave him a puzzled nod, unsure anymore if he even knew he was looking at someone. He kept starring. You all right there, buddy. Shouted into the night. He kept starring. My eyes were beginning to adjust to the darkness, and I started studying his face. His severely receding hairline, that thick monobrow, the pale complexion and gaunt look, those monster eyes. My mind began whirling around the pillars that held up the part of my brain that stored those childhood memories, and just as some ancient nerves caught fire in my stomach again. I saw the sparkle of silver wrapped around the fingers of one of his hands as he removed it from his pocket and began making his way towards the building's entrance. My hands went numb and the cigarette landed in his path. I heard the thud of his boots as he stepped on it before disappearing below me. I staggered away from the window like a hit soldier and dashed back to my desk where my phone lied underneath, resting on a damaged laptop. I went to dial 911 and saw the time as I scrambled to work my phone. 03. The operator asked my emergency, but my breath and words were sucked out of my lungs when I heard the clink of rings clutching the metal rails of my building stairs three stories down. Hello? Do you have an emergency? The swishing of a cagoule was joined by the thud of thick boots as the clanging grew louder. Slowly lowered the phone from my ear ignoring the faint questioning of the operator. The noises ceased, and in the hallway light that seeped under the crack of my door, I saw the shadow of two feet waiting in dead stillness outside my home. They didn't budge an inch. It was like an empty pair of shoes rather than human limbs. I couldn't bring myself to make any sudden movements and the phone in my limp arm felt like it was a mild journey from my face. I mustered up all the energy I could find the guts to use and clicked the speaker button on my phone with my thumb. Is everything alright? Do you need an ambulance? Bursted out of my phone and I felt the vibration from the volume. One shadow disappeared shortly followed by the other. The thudding began vanishing and the clanging disappeared with the same urgency it arrived with. I shivered in the silence for a few seconds before collapsing onto the floor allowing my body to fold into the foidal position. I began crying uncontrollably. He was the exact same. It was 18 years later, and the clothes, the face and those emotionless eyes were the EXECT same. Are you okay? Can you hear me? My terror was replaced with confusion for less than a second. Everything is fine, sorry, I whispered, doing a poor job of fighting the shake in my voice before hanging up the phone. I didn't want the police. I didn't want it to feel real. I wanted to run a million miles away and forget who I was and what I was going through. My thoughts ricocheted off of the inside of my head and images I hadn't seen for 18 years flashed before my eyes. In the midst of chaotic panic, my mind acknowledged a question from all those years ago I could finally answer differently. Did you see his monster eyes? Daniel didn't know who or where Daniel was anymore and I hadn't lived in the state that we started this in since I was in my early 20s. All I knew was he saw what I just did long before I had to, and he lived with it. I wasn't thinking logically anymore. There wasn't any logic in a situation like this. I knew what I was going to do whether it made sense or not. I had to do something. I grabbed my wallet, 
my keys, my beers, and a kitchen knife on the way out. I set up the directions for an old address on my GPS and started the engine. I knew finding Daniel was hopeless. I'd search for him and many other old classmates on social media yearly. Nothing ever came up, but there was one more way back into the life I'd forgotten about. I leant on my dashboard and remembered seeing Oren's parents at his graduation, telling them I hope their son ends up someplace great. I made two quick prayers, one begging that they haven't moved and the other hoping that wherever they send me to find their son, it was much greater for him than the place I'll be dragging him back to. With that, I pulled out of my building's parking lot with adrenaline in my veins, alcohol in my system, and the swishing of a cagoule in my head. Have you ever hitchhiked before? If you did, then I have to say that you are really a fearless person. In my case, I rarely did that even before I bought my own car cause I found it the most ineffective way for traveling. I couldn't understand why so many people chooses to travel in this embarrassing and dangerous way, and some crazy driver can kindly accept these strangers to sit in their car for a free ride. I never thought that one day I would stood on the side of the highway and hitchhike for once more. However, sometimes the reality is even worse than your worst imagination. I went to visit a friend that day, I set up at 6 in the afternoon, and it was already 11.30 p.m. when I sit in my car again and started to drove home. I found something wrong with the car cause I heard a strange sound when I started the engine, but I ignored it and just kept driving. I was expecting to arrive home at about 2 o'clock a.m. The highway was just the same as I came, stretched out flat and straight ahead, and the figure of the forest beside the road is in the mist of darkness like it was covered with a black veil. The classical music in my speaker flew smoothly inside the car. Suddenly, everything stopped. The music, the engine, the headlight, everything stopped at one moment. I realized that my car has broken down on the middle of my journey, on this part of the highway which has to take an hour's drive to go to the nearest town. I cursed everything I could have blamed while trying to get the car back to work again, but soon I knew that my attempt was in vain. I reached for my phone, opened my bag, and was confused for one moment. Shit. I left it in my friend's house. What should I do now? It's impossible for me to walk back home at 12.16 a.m. along a highway in the wild forest. I realize that there are no other options. Only one thing that I can do. Ten minutes later, and I was still standing on the highway. The wind was howling, leaking my exposed skin, taking away the heat from my body. Dim light of the street lamp spread smoothly on me, but still couldn't drive away the fear and cold brought by darkness. The only thing I can expect is that someone would drive on this highway at the middle of the night and was kind enough to help a young lady get back home. Didn't know how long I waited, I was just standing, hoping to see the headlight of a car. Wind was still howling, sneering at me with its low and powerful voice. I began to stretch my legs and arms to prevent them from getting numb, but that didn't work. The light was twisting in my eyes made me want to sleep, draining all the rest of my heat and sanity. Then the light appeared. It came out from the edge of the highway. At first I considered it as my illusion, but soon I recognized that this light was the thing I always expected, and it's the only chance for me to escape from here. Dragged myself to the highway, stood in the way of that car. Thought that I would stop it whatever it costs. I would rather to die in a car accident than to be killed by the cold. I could see that the car is getting closer. The headlight was not very bright, only a little bit brighter than the streetlight. I was still standing there, waving my arms, giving my signal to the driver. Apparently that the driver had seen me, the car's speed decreased, and eventually stopped right in front of me. After a few seconds of silence. I heard a low but soft voice of a man, get in. I froze, what? 
I thought. I never thought that it would be so easy. I've prepared for anything to happen when I stood in his way, and now this is far easier than I expected. I could feel his words like an order, rather than a suggestion, which made me a little bit uncomfortable. However, like I said, I had no choice. All I could do is to get in the car with a polite, thanks. It took me about 10 seconds to realize that the back seat is actually a safer choice for me, but the car was already moving when I had this thought, so I didn't say anything. The air conditioner was on. Heat filled this small space. It was such a pleasant thing to have heat back to my body again. I could feel that it came from my legs at first. I was able to feel my toes again. Seconds later, I found that the warm air came from everywhere. There was no reason for me to refuse it, so I just relaxed and let it enter my body. I closed my eyes and almost suddenly fell into sleep. It was a peaceful dream, until a scream ripped the sweet and quiet atmosphere into pieces. The scream was so despair and filled with the original fear of mankind. The most important thing is that sound was so familiar to me. It was my voice. That night was a nightmare to me forever. Now I could remember our conversation, every single word, every movement of him and me. It's like it just happened in yesterday. I woke up at once and almost fell off my seat. Had a bad dream, he asked in a soft and restful voice. Yes, I replied. You only slept for three minutes and 25 seconds. It took me a few seconds for me to realize what he just said. Why were you counting that? I was trying to find something interesting to say. It may a long journey for both you and me. His strange behavior alerted me. I still didn't say anything, but at that moment I was already building my psychological defenses. Why you turned off the lights? The light blinded me, and you may understand if you drive. I, I understand. Good, now we have the basic trust we may need. By the way, I never turned off anything. At that moment I suddenly realized that the street lights were off. Bad time for this, isn't it? He said, followed with a soft and sneering laughter. I didn't answer this time, just simply because I didn't want to. The relaxation is gone. I was quite nervous, and a little bit scared. It seems like you forgot to tell me something. What? Your destination. The town I live is at the end of this road. You just need to stop when we get there. Fine. How far? I think we still need an hour. Then we can stay together for another hour. What do you mean? No offense, I mean you will be safe at home in an hour. Hey. What? Want to talk? Didn't know what was he thinking, but I know that he may get angry if I refuse his requirement. His anger may bring disasters on me if he is a dangerous person. Okay. This is a dangerous place and time to hitchhike, you know. I know. Your car had some problems, isn't it? It did. Need my phone to call for help. People are always wise when they imagine themselves in a dangerous situation. But if they are really in a situation like this, they don't know what to do. I didn't expect that he would give me such kind of help. At that moment I relaxed my vigilance which made me regret forever. Here, sure, thank you. The phone is in the bag inside the locker. Sorry I can't reach it for you cause I need to focus on driving. I opened the locker, the bag was inside. Again, I glanced him when I did this. He was still in the dark, didn't had a single movement. His hands are still holding the steering wheel. But it was very strange to me think that he had already kept that posture for 20 minutes. Why he didn't move? Two months ago, someone found a body of a young hitch girl like you, in the forest near this highway. I felt sick and was completely freaked out at that moment. He has already murdered three girls, all hitchhikers. The atmosphere in the car is becoming strange. I had a bad feeling about this so I quietly put my hands on the door switch and hoped that the door wasn't locked. 
Jumping out would be my only way to escape if the guy beside me turns to a FICO. Are you scared? What do you want? My voice shivered when I spoke, fear crowd on my back, and I was ready to jump out at any second. Look behind. As soon as I did that I flung open the car door and jumped out. The ground was hard and a sharp pain stabbed into my arms, but I know I'm safe when I saw that car drove straight ahead without stopping. Later I was picked up by a police officer who coincidentally drove by. He told me that the story was true, and the man that night was highly suspicious. Told everything I could remember to them later at the police station. Several years have passed by now, but at every cold winter night, when the wind starts knocking at my window, I can still feel that man, like he is just right beside me. I couldn't forget the things I saw at the last few seconds. It will haunt around me forever. The driver was not the person at the driver's seat. He was already gone. That skinny, pale killer placed him there to keep the car going. Himself was hiding at the back seat spoke to me all the time, and just waited patiently, with a giant smile on his face. I survived a home invasion. My well-to-do brother was going on vacation and requested that I, a teacher, take care of his dogs for the week and a half he'd be gone. Having nothing better to do, I assented and drove myself over to their place in the city suburbs. I thought it would be like a vacation, but soon found that living in someone else's house can actually be boring as hell. I spent most of my time watching his limited cable package, playing his dusty two pounds, and eating his food. There were two dogs to watch over. Musingly, my brother had both a giant American bulldog named Lucy, who was 80 pounds of muscle and bone, and an adorable Dachshund named Coco that belonged to his fiancé. All I really had to do was keep the dogs fed and watered, and prevent Lucy from killing anyone who had the gall to come near the house. The only annoying thing about my job was that some of the rooms were absolutely filthy. It was so bad that my brother instructed me not to even step foot in either his bedroom or the guest room due to embarrassment about their condition. The living room, kitchen, and basement contained your average millennial sloppiness. But their bedroom was covered floor to ceiling in dirty clothes, crusted plates of food, and trash. The stench of weed was also distinguishable. His guest room was little better used to hoard nearly everything he and his girl had no place for. It was also filled with junk, and I never went near its tiny closet, for fear of being buried in an avalanche of furniture, duds and other crap they didn't need. It was a ridiculous situation for someone as wealthy as my brother seemed to be. I didn't understand why they didn't just hire a mare. He asked me to stay clear of both rooms, and I was happy to oblige sleeping instead on the couch in the basement, where I could at least move freely without stepping on an old dog turd. The first few days, everything was fine. Generally just dicked around on my phone or the television. I had classes to make for the next year, but even in my supreme boredom I couldn't bring myself to do any real work. And even if I wanted to do on my laptop, I quickly ran into a technical problem. My brother lived in a rougher suburb, so he had two small security cameras that connected to an app I could pull up on my phone or laptop. These cameras had motion sensors that would detect when someone came to either the front or back door. Instead of doing their jobs properly, the damn things went off like crazy every quarter hour or so. I received these incessant notifications, motion detected, front door. But whenever I checked the app or the doors themselves, no one was there, and the rewound footage showed only empty air. Was tempted to turn the app off completely, but I instead just ignored the constant buzzes on my phone and laptop. The weird stuff started happening on the third night. 
I had locked everything up and was taking my evening shit in the basement bathroom when I heard the sound of banging glass. It was coming from somewhere outside the house, like someone was clanging to be let in. I was trying to pinpoint where the hell the noise was coming from, but it stopped nearly soon as it started. The dogs, Lucy especially, lost their shit. This was midnight, so I came to the conclusion that I was about to be burgled slash murdered, but there was no other sounds besides the dogs. Rushing off the toilet, I grabbed my phone and checked the camera app. No one at either door, realizing I had to do something. Snatched the tiny handgun my brother left me and tentatively made my way out of the basement. Coco followed me, snarling. All the lights were out, just like I left them, but I quickly changed that. I checked the windows on all three floors to ensure they were locked. I double-checked the screen doors too. Everything was latched shut. There was no sign of any forced entry and the backyard was clear. In the darkness outside all I could see was my brother's small storage shed and a ladder he hadn't bothered to put away lying placidly in the grass. The shed was padlocked closed. I thought about calling the police, but even as I considered it I began to doubt what I had heard. Was it really a banging outside of the house? Or had it been something inane, like thunder or the wind? I just couldn't be sure, and my family has always been wary of law enforcement, so I held off on alerting anyone. I sat up with the dogs that night until sleep finally took me. Nothing else happened. I called my brother the next day, and he agreed with me that I shouldn't get too paranoid. He said it was probably for the best not to call the cops, that he hears weird noises in the house all the time because it was built with cheap, rickety materials. Nevertheless, I was on edge. I checked the blinds constantly, and my eyes were glued to the app to make sure no one was crawling around the front or back door. Unfortunately for me, weird shit kept happening. As the week wore on, there was no more banging on glass at nights, but I started to hear something else. At first, I thought it was my own brain making white noise to drown out the quiet, but soon I realized it was coming from the house itself, from inside the walls. It was a static sound that I recognized somehow, but couldn't quite pin down in my mind. It was like an electrical whirring that I could just barely make out when the everything was silent in the dead of night, or when the dogs napped during the daytime. It seemed to jump around from spot to spot, but never lasted long. I became nervous feeling trapped in the place that was supposed to be my vacation home. I didn't leave the house much at that point, but when I did go out to get food or something, the dogs would always follow me to the door and whine more than usual as if they didn't want me to go. I had to close their pen often to keep them from following me around everywhere. Thankfully, they started to calm down majorly after about a week of my being there, but I quickly became freaked out by this too. Both Lucy and Coco started sleeping about 18 hours each day. They would flop down next to me in the basement and wouldn't move for what felt like an eternity. Coco especially looked so comatose that I started checking her for a pulse every now and then. I could barely get them to eat or go to the bathroom. In fear of allowing them to just drop dead, I made a vet appointment for both dogs. They ran some routine tests and told me that there was nothing wrong with either dog physically, and that maybe the excitement of a new face had just worn them down. That sounded like the stupidest thing I ever heard, but I had no better explanation. Shit hit the fan in the second week at the house. The app was constantly telling me someone was at the front and back doors, and the dogs kept going back and forth between whining fearfully and snoring in my lap. The whirring sound sent chills down my spine whenever I heard it. I was getting hardly any sleep at all. Every night before bed, I checked and rechecked all the windows, some of which didn't have blinds. The unshakable feeling that I was being watched drove me to dread and anxiety. I covered the blindless windows with blankets, and I kept the gun near me 24 7 The place was becoming like a prison but I felt bound to protect it. One evening, 
Exhaustion overtook me, and I collapsed on the couch. The whirring sound woke me up, louder than it had ever been, but this time it was accompanied by footsteps moving within the house. I swear to God they were some heavy footfalls, but they moved so slowly that even in the moment, I couldn't accept what I was hearing. Was someone there? The footsteps plodded exceedingly slowly above me in the upstairs where the two restricted rooms were. Suddenly, a sick thought struck me. I hadn't gone up in those rooms hardly at all the past few days. What if someone was hiding in one of them the whole time? They were so disgusting that I thought them off limits, but that didn't mean they were empty. The dogs lay beside me, completely oblivious in their slumber. As silently as I could, I retrieved the gun and my phone and trembling, made my way to the top floor. Still couldn't call the police, not until I was sure I wasn't acting crazy. Checked my brother's room first. I was electrified with terror as I opened the door, remembering every horror movie I had ever seen. It was completely empty, full of only trash, scrawling ants, and rotten odors, just as he had left it. I just had to check the guest bedroom, and I'd be safe. That's when my phone buzzed, motion detected, front door, son of a bitch. If I was maintaining any stealth, it was gone now. I waited for something to happen. Maniac to charge me from the stairs or the bedroom door. Hell, at this point I wouldn't have been surprised to see an electrical fan demon pop out of the wall whirring at me. But nothing happened. After five bone-chilling minutes of silence, I finally gathered the courage to check the front door camera on my phone. As always, an empty porch greeted me tried to keep my breathing calm as I opened the door to the guest bedroom. It was also empty, just junk piled high and no sign of footprints or any whirring sound. My eyes fell on the last spot of the house that I hadn't swept yet, the small closet. I actually started to feel better about the whole situation. I had been so strung out that I had to have been hearing things and I had no actual evidence of anyone in the house except my untrustworthy ears. I threw open the closet door, and just as I was expecting, there was no one and no thing there, except a window. A window I hadn't a thing noticed in all of my time at the house. I wanted to strangle whoever built this place. Why put a window in the closet of the spare bedroom? What did that contribute to the aesthetic of the house? The window was unlocked. Someone had cut away the glass just enough to pop a fist-sized piece out and unlatch it. They had replaced that piece carefully, so only a clear investigation would reveal it. But how the hell could a person use a window on the second floor of the house to get in? Unless they were some Assassin's Creed-type mother effers, they couldn't just climb up the gutter in broad daylight. Then I remembered the ladder in the yard, not locked up just laying in the grass waiting for anybody to come along and make use of it. I cursed my brother. More details came to my fearful eyes. Littering the floor were candy bar wrappers, a dirty blanket, and two water bottles filled with pale yellow liquid. My heart sunk further. Someone had been in the house with me and the dogs. It was at this moment that I knew I couldn't wait any longer. Darkness was coming on and I had no ifing intentions of staying in that house tonight. I had to call the police. My phone buzzed right before the glass shattered. Motion detected. Front door. Motion detected. Back door. Oh F. The screen door cracked, and now a tremendous banging rang out from the front porch, panicking. Tried to do too many things at once. Was trying to dial 911 but instead clicked the camera app open. A large man was plying away at the hinges of the front door with a crowbar. He was brawn and tall. On his face was a grinning skull balaclava. I was about to piss myself. He would be in in seconds. I nearly fell down the stairs, and then I was face to face with the door. All I could hear was the clanging as balaclava man beat his way inside. The hinges were bent 
ready to burst. And not some sort of action hero. I was an idiot scared out of his mind and faced with a home invasion. I felt like I had no way of handling. I did the only thing I thought made sense. Fired five times into the door. The gun wasn't all that powerful. It was a 9mm. But it made a hell of a lot of noise. For an instant I even felt some relief because I knew someone, even in this bad neighborhood, would soon call the police for me. The banging stopped and I heard a groaning from behind the front door. I opened it and found the man gasping on the ground, chest full of holes. Shockingly, the screen door was still partially intact. That's how I saw the reflection of another figure behind me. This one was skinnier. A rail of a person covered with tattoos. Their face was pale white, beyond a natural human skin color. Their lips were strangely feminine, but the blank features left me completely unsettled. The intruder was wearing something like this. A heavy metallic object struck the back of skull with a wet thud. The figure pulled me back into the house. It struck me again, this time in the face, and I crumpled to the floor. There was little pain, it was all disorientation. I didn't lose consciousness, but I was concussed. Looking up, I saw the pale face above me. It had hit me with a metal detector. Where is it? Male voice shouted. Then, grabbing me off the floor, where the F is it? What? I. What? I stuttered out, barely able to comprehend what was happening. Where's? What? Seeing I was in no condition to talk, he let me crumple and began pacing the floor, unsure of what to do. He ripped off his mask to reveal a bony, hard face glistening with sweat. A teardrop tattoo rested on his cheek. In the far distance, I thought I could hear sirens. My vision was heavily blurred, and the lights of the house made my head split. Then, the man started tearing the house apart. He pulled the cushions off the couch, swept ants off the kitchen counter, and about destroyed the shoe closet. It was nearly comical. He turned his attention toward the basement. It's gotta be there, he murmured, eyeing the dog gate that led to the basement. He opened it and charged down. The next thing I heard was yelping and a splattering sound, followed by a series of barks and yips. With a grunt I forced myself off the floor and just barely made it down the stairs, gun in hand. The intruder was trying desperately to shield his throat from Lucy, who was snapping at his arm with a kind of animal ferocity we all forget that dogs have. The man's shoulder was already gashed to hell and bleeding profusely. A luminescent blue vein hung limply out of it. Coco clung viciously to his pants leg, refusing to let him go. FF get off me, he screamed, ignorant of my presence. I know that shooting people is supposed to be hard, but in this scenario, the only trouble I had was aiming. I was concussed, scared, and angry all at once. These effers had been in the house for God knows how long, and they had scared the absolute shit out of me, and the dogs. I emptied seven rounds into his gut. At the sound of the gunfire, the dogs yelped and dashed away. Thankfully, I didn't hit them. The man first bolted up, eyes wide, then whirled and slumped against the wall. I kept firing an empty pistol at his twitching figure. And then the cop triggered. I didn't hear them break down the door. I didn't hear anyone shout for me to drop the gun. And I'll be damned if I heard the actual report of the pistol. Thankfully, the cop only hit me once and didn't fire at any of the dogs, who were barking madly and dashing around the room. Before I passed out, I felt Lucy's tongue lapping my face. I woke up in the hospital a day later, is connected to my arm and oxygen running through my nose. As my condition improved, I learned a series of terrible revelations. I'll try to summarize them briefly here. My brother was not a businessman as he had led my family to believe. Instead, he and his fiancé had been working as accountants for a large drug operation in the city for the past five years. It was good money, 
but it was of course a massive risk. My brother was also not on vacation, but instead was laying low in order to avoid being found because he had stolen a briefcase of cocaine from the people he worked for that was valued at about $120,000. The cocaine was in the house with me the whole time because as my brother said at his trial, he believed the dealers wouldn't look for it there if he himself was gone. The people who had attacked us were trying to locate that case, which it turned out had enough metal be detected. They had to be careful not to spook me, the dogs, or any neighbors if they hoped to find it. As it turned out, it was in my brother's disgusting bedroom in a hidden compartment inside their dresser. His plan was to come back a week or so later, collect his money, even if I had been killed, it was hidden well enough to go unfound, and get the hell out of the state as fast as he could. In his plan, I was an expendable patsy. The man through the front door was the muscle of the operation. He probably wasn't supposed to step foot in the house unless something bad happened. When I discovered the upstairs window, he sprung into action to stop me from alerting the police. The police found in Suv down the road that he was operating from. He lived. The skinny mask guy died. He was the brains of the operation. It was him who set up the firmware that caused the cameras in the house to register motion every few minutes. He also cracked open the upstairs window and was using the metal detector to search through the house each night. Additionally, he was drugging Lucy and Coco's food with a sedative each day in order to make them sluggish. It terrifies me to this day that he was able to move so freely throughout the house without my noticing. I assume he was there for the majority of the week. The dogs must have sensed him, but he was apparently very good at staying under the radar as he moved unseen through the house I was bunkered down in. That's the end of my story. I was a suspect for a bit, but eventually all evidence pointed to me being nothing more than a red herring and a patsy. My brother and his FNK both went to prison on felony drug trafficking charges. I'm not sure I'll ever be able to talk to them again, but I have at least two decades to make that decision. The whole thing messed me up pretty badly. Eventually I copied my brother's idea and left the state forever. The man I killed might have friends who want revenge, but if anyone ever does come back for me, if they track me down and invade my home, I won't worry too much, because every night when I go to sleep, I have old Lucy and Coco by my side. And the 9mm on my nightstand doesn't hurt either. Three nights ago, I awoke to the sound of someone pounding on my front door. Bang, bang, bang. I jumped out of bed, heart pounding, and moved toward the living room. The microwave in the kitchen read 3.17 AM. No one should be awake right now. No one should pounding on the door. Bang, bang, bang. My front door has a frosted glass window. In front of it is a screen door. Whoever was pounding on the door was pounding on the side of the house because I could hear the screen door rattle slightly with each hit. Through the frosted glass, I could make out the fuzzy shape of a person. Crept closer, all the while thinking that this must be some mistake or that some drunk maniac from around the neighborhood had gotten lost and didn't know what time or day it is. Peeked out of the one clear spot in the door. The figure appeared to have his back turned to me, which I found strange. He slashed she was wearing a hooded sweatshirt with the hood pulled over their head. I didn't recognize their height or shape. Chill came over me. The figure turned quickly. Bang, bang, bang. I jumped back. He slashed she slashed it grabbed the door handle and started to jiggle the lock aggressively. There was no way I was opening this door. My wife was sleeping in our bedroom out back. My daughter was upstairs. Stop. Yelled, I've got a gun in here. I was lying, obviously. I hadn't even had time to grab my cell phone and I'd stupidly forgotten the baseball bat by the side of my bed. Bang, bang, 
No you don't, came the response. The voice sounded metallic, strained, like it was used to screaming. The figure grabbed the door handle and again murderously attempted to get the door open. I thanked God I had remembered to lock the door and began to think about whether the other ones were secure too. That's when I heard the recognizable sound of my sliding glass door opening. I froze. One figure was still on the porch. Something else was entering the house. The glass door is off the kitchen, which was between me, my wife in the back and my daughter upstairs. I was in a total panic and my brain wouldn't let me do anything. Michael, came a voice from the kitchen. It had that same metallic quality to it. It was not my wife's voice and my name is not Michael. Michael, Michael, Michael. A figure leaped out into the open space in the kitchen. He landed with the sickening grace of a ballerina. He was tall, lanky. His back was to me but it was as if he knew exactly where I was. I was frozen. Michael. He spun around and I found myself staring into a mask of death. Eyelids had been stitched shut, but the mouth curled up into a wide grin. The thing cocked his head sideways. Not. It began. Michael. Bang. 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 The door jiggling. Bang. Bang. The figure on the porch was furiously pounding on the door. I felt stuck. Suddenly, a light turned on in the back. James, what's going on? My wife had woken up. At the sudden flood of light, the thing in the kitchen spun and recoiled. I found my courage and longed at the creature but it shrugged me off as if it were disciplining an overzealous dog. I landed on the kitchen floor and the thing fled the kitchen, out the same way it got in. Gone also was the figure from the porch. I looked at the clock, 3.23. The ordeal had taken less than 10 minutes. My wife arrived and was thoroughly confused about what I was doing. We need to call the police. I told her and then explained about what had just happened. The cops were convinced it was just a simple home robbery attempt. They told me the duo must have thought I lived alone, and that the intruder in the kitchen must have been wearing a mask. I started arguing, but they were convinced that sleep deprivation caused me to think otherwise. Refused to give in, this all felt deliberate. Who was Michael and what the hell had he gotten himself wrapped up in? What would have happened had my wife not woken up? and turned on that light. I've spent the last few nights wide awake and armed in the living room. Things have been quiet, but I can't shake the feeling that they'll be back, that despite their apparent mistake, it will be me who ends up paying some ultimate price. 3.27 AM I open my eyes to darkness. Upon realizing that my heart is racing, my senses quickly adjust to the situation as if activated by some primitive instinct. Someone is in my house. The footsteps drag along on the other side of the door. Hardly lifting from the floor, the rhythm is irregular, and I hear a low guttural moaning. It was the kind of wail one would expect to hear from a thousand-year-old ghost looking for a lost love. I remember that my sister is at the end of the hall. I pick up my phone to call the police. My phone is dead. I plug into the charger, count to three, and then hold the power button. I can't hear the footsteps anymore. The phone chimes to life with a ringtone that might as well have been a siren, for the silence hadn't been bothered by even the wind at that moment. I hear the feet directly on the other side of my door. It began to attack the door, pounding and scratching. I scream and get to my feet tear through my blinds and reach to unlock the window. I see the figure of a standing beast, standing outside my window, its form emitting a darkness greater than the opaque landscape it stands in front of, completely overridden by the threats surrounding me. I cower like an animal under my bed. The pounding has stopped, all that is left is a slow and rhythmic scratching, and then a frantic whispering as if the creature's lips were pressed against my door. Vowels and sounds being delivered by a throat that sounded full of mucus. And then it stopped.
Hello, I'm writing this down as I hide in the bathroom. There is a horrible wolf thing, and it's roaming around the library as I speak. Let's just start at the beginning. It was morning, when I woke up the sun was shining, and everything around me was cheerful, except me of course. It was a Monday when I was making a bowl of my favorite cereal. Sat down and picked up my phone. I was scrolling through it when I saw a reminder. The reminder read, make sure you go to the library at 8.30 for a job interview. Completely forgot about my job. There was no more time for cereal I had to go to my interview. I ran down the stairs in a hurry and opened the door. I was running so fast that I forgot it was still winter. I slipped on some ice and ran into my car. My face was hurting now, and I reached for my nose. When I felt around there was no sign of blood. I reached for my car door and opened it. I started my engine and booked it to the library. Was barely there in time. I opened the door to the library and ran inside. I saw a door that said manager and opened it. There was a person sitting at the desk. The manager I suppose. He stood up and greeted me. Good morning. Are you the new worker? His voice was gruff. W. Will, yes sir I am. My name is Jacob. The manager waved me away. Yee yee, my name is James. So kid you sure you want this job? James looked serious now. W. Well, yes James. I need it. I hated how whiny my voice sounded, but James didn't notice. Well Jacob are you good at following rules? He looked at me his eyes narrowing. I wasn't really but it was a library, it wouldn't be too hard. Yes I am sir, my voice cracked as I looked at James narrowing eyes. Good, Och Jacob come back at 10.30, that is when your shift will start. I looked at him confused but not daring to say a word. Oh sir, I will be there. I was about to turn around when James spoke. Wait, there's something I need to give you first. James gave me a piece of paper and on it were rules. It was almost 10.30, I had to go to my job soon. I didn't even bother to read the rules. I looked at my watch as it said 10.25. I walked out of my house and into my car the rules in my hand. I scoffed at how weird this was. Wouldn't the library be closed at this time? I looked at the list of rules and decided I would read them when I got to the library. A few minutes later I saw the old library. It looked even worse at night. The cracked windows, the faded paint, and the brown grass surrounding the building. The library was always creepy. That's why I never went near it as a kid, but now I have a job in it. Opened the library doors and sat down at the front desk. Picked up the rules and looked at them laughing as I read them. Rule 1. If a customer comes in give them whatever they want, they will usually ask for a red ribbon. If they ask you that then look in the bottom left drawer and give them it. And if they ask for a book sign it out like you would do with any customer. Rule 2. Never look into a customer's eyes, if you do they will try and take yours. If you look into their eyes you must get some water and pour it onto them. This will make them scream and disappear looked up as I heard a door open. It was a customer. I did the mistake of looking into its eyes. The customer's eyes were a deep red. There were no pupils or irises, only red. It screamed and lunged over the counter. Give me your eyes. Its voice was hoarse as if never speaking in years. I looked around and found a water bottle. I grabbed it and opened the lid. I threw the bottle at the creature's face and it hissed. The creature's body began to smoke. The smell was horrible. All that was left of the creature was the smell. I ran back to the desk and read some more of the rules. But this time I believed them. Rule 3. If you hear a scraping sound coming from the manager's door, open it and say, Sir, please stop. The scraping sound will stop. It won't return until the next day. Rule 4. If you hear a barking from outside hide in any room and lock the door. If you make a sound it will get you. The creature is blind, 
and will leave the next morning. I sighed and looked at the books around me. I heard a door open and almost screamed. It was another customer. I looked at its feet and didn't look up. Excuse me, sir, can you give me a red ribbon? Its voice sounded like a human's, but its feet had claws. It stood on to legs. It must have been about six feet tall. Yes, of course. As my hand shook, I opened the bottom left drawer and got a red ribbon. Handed it to the thing, and it gave me some coins. Thank you, sir. It walked out of the room, its tail following. I heard a scraping from inside of the manager's room and stood up. I hate my job. I grumbled and opened the door. Sir, please stop. The creature hissed and I heard footsteps retreat. That was when I heard a barking and the sound of glass breaking. I looked for the closest room and booked it. The thing must have heard me do it and ran towards me. I ran into the bathroom and locked the door behind me. I heard a growling followed by a bang. The creature was trying to get in. And this is where I must end my story. I knew I shouldn't have gotten this job. This job was a nightmare. My phone is about to die and I didn't read all of the rules. I will do nothing until it is morning. The manager said he would be back at 6 o'clock. That is three hours away. My job will be rough. It's 4 o'clock a.m. in the morning, and the barking has stopped. I'm afraid to open the door. I should have got the rules list, so I would know what to do. But now, the boredom got a hold of me, and I might open the door. I'm afraid that if the wolf creature is still there, it would get me. I looked under the door to see nothing there. Unlocked the door and opened it. There was nothing. No wolf creature. Was safe for now. I looked at the clock above the bathroom door to see it turn to 4-1 a.m. I sighed. There's still two hours until my shift is done. And maybe if I survive there might be more. I looked at the front desk to see the list of rules. I sat down and read Rule 5. Rule 5. If you hear a noise in the vents get a book and lighter and run out of the building to burn the book. The creature will see a fire and run. It hates fire. I looked at Rule 5 and wondered why it was scared of fire. I kept on reading. Rule 6. If there are multiple customers at once kill them all. There should only be one customer at a time. The more customers there are the more angry they become. I looked at the water bottle on my desk. It was almost empty. I looked around in search for a water fountain and filled my bottle up at once. I noticed a small glow coming off one of the books. I quickly looked at all of the rule again. Rule 6. If a book is glowing, put it outside. The more I looked at the book, the more it glowed. After a few minutes, I couldn't take it anymore. I threw the book outside and head back inside. Rule 8. If you see a tall creature with a hat and a human-like face, then that is Sam. Sam is a nice creature. He will help you out with the books. If you give him the glowing book, the glowing book should be outside, so you won't have a problem with Sam. I looked outside to see the glowing book. I looked at the clock to see that it was 4.37. Rule 9. If you feel a tap on your shoulder, do not turn around. Just don't. This is probably the most important rule. If you turn around, you will see nothing. If you turn back around, though, you will be greeted with the trickster. The trickster will then paralyze you until morning. And let's just hope you survive by then. I felt a top on my shoulder and was about to turn around and realized it was the trickster looked in front of me but it was hard. It was like the trickster was pulling me in. I looked at the rules again to see if there was anything to do. Rule 9. If you are visited by the trickster then make sure you stand up and say, damn I need a break. When you say this walk to the restroom, the trickster should leave you alone for now. I looked at my feet and sighed. I stood up. Damn, my back's killing me I need a break. I ran towards the restroom and closed the door. That was close. I sighed. This time I had the list of rules in my hand. 
Rule 10. If you hear laughter coming from outside close your eyes until it stops. I looked at the clock it was 6.35. A searing pain went through my hand as I looked down on it. Where fingernails used to be were claws. And where flesh was were blue scales. My eyes started to burn and I held them. I had to get out of here. I grabbed the rules and went into my car. As I got inside my house I read the rules again. Rule 11. Don't stay longer than your shift. You must always leave at 6 o'clock. If you don't you will turn into one of the creatures like Sam. I drove as fast as I could to my house. My hand was on fire and so were my eyes. Heard a scraping in my car and pulled the brake. I looked behind me but there was nothing. I inhaled as I heard the scraping again. It was getting louder in sound. Turned around again, but saw nothing. Who's there? Show yourself. As I spoke the scraping stopped, but it was followed by a loud blood-curdling scream. Looked around to see a big wolf-like creature, but it wasn't even a wolf. Where a tail should be was a long canine-like jaw, and where paws should have been were bird-like talons. The face of the beast was like something you would have seen from the thing. But this creature, it was real. I was frozen in fear. It came closer to me, until finally it was right next to my car. Its words were slow and cold. Its eyes were almost lifeless. Its breathing was raspy. You humans are so stupid. You destroy the things we love. You build stupid contraptions that are useless to us. You use dark magic to trap us in these buildings. You write us like you write a character. A thing. We used to live in peace, but you humans became filthy with greed. You are what plagues this world. After the thing stopped speaking I gasped. What does it mean by trapped in buildings? I looked out my window again, but it was gone. All that was left was a single piece of paper. All that was written on it was, you are different somehow. You listen but, you don't follow through with what you need to do. Human, if you want to live then you need to help me. Destroy the library and you will be fixed of any mistake you have caused. Please human, help us. It's hard trying to sleep and seeing that your hand is scaly and blue. Decided not to sleep today so everything sucked. Stood up, my body was sweaty and stiff, and slowly I walked to the bathroom. I needed to brush my teeth. Opened the wooden door and grabbed my toothbrush. I looked in the mirror and was horrified that one of my eyes was bright green. I looked at my other eye to see that it was still brown. Today will be interesting. Squirted some toothpaste on my toothbrush, its minty scent making my mouth water brushed my yellow tinted teeth and spit out the toothpaste. I looked at my phone to see it was almost 10.30 p.m. I went into my living room and grabbed my car keys and a list of rules. Looked at the list and realized that something was off. There was no seventh rule. I looked over and over again, not seeing the seventh rule. The hell. What if I break it? Oh, I'm so screwed. I grumbled under my breath, was about to open my front door and realized that I needed gloves for my hands. I walked into my kitchen and opened a drawer. There was a pair of light gray gloves in it along with toothpicks. I ran towards my front door and opened it. I slammed my car door shut and sped to the library. I almost ran into my manager James. Why, Jacob what are you doing? I looked at James and gasped for breath. Sorry, I didn't want to be late. James looked at me confused, looked at his watch and croaked. Well, Ock, get in there before customers come. Opened the door to the library and realized I needed to ask James about Rule 7. I ran back outside and looked around. Wait, Ja, James wasn't anywhere to be seen. Then I remembered that my car was the only car there. I looked around and saw nothing but shadows. Shrugged it off and went back into the library. 
I looked over the rules again, and spotted that where rule 7 should be, was pen ink crossing it out. All I could make out were, rule 7, don't trust the person named Jigir is no man. That was all I could make out. I looked at the seventh rule again. What did it mean by man? Was there a man here before? Probably, but why cross it out? Is the man a dangerous creature? Gasped as I heard laughter. I looked over the rules again and remembered rule 10. I closed my eyes immediately. Could hear kids laughing, but it didn't really sound like laughing. It was mixed with sobbing and screaming. Opened my eyes a little and immediately the laughing got louder. It felt like my head was going to explode my eyes closed, and my ears started to bleed. But finally what felt like hours the screaming stopped. I opened my eyes as little light blobs ran across my vision. I closed my eyes again and shook my head. I slowly opened my eyes to hear a door open and a scuffle across the floor. Hello, human boy, could I speak to the manager? I gulped. There was no rules about this. Then an idea struck me. Sure, ma'am, just follow me. I grabbed my water bottle as I heard an arrogant hiss. Quickly turned around and sprayed the hideous creature. It's brown fur smoking, and its red eyes melting all over its face. It then screeched at me. No, you idiot I am trying to help you. Have read your rules for years and rule 7 is the most danger. It couldn't speak anymore as its throat got charred and cracked open. I huffed as I heard a scraping from the manager's room. I opened the door and spoke calmly. Sir, please don't do that. It scratched the door again and retreated. I sighed as I remembered what happened yesterday. I was about to scratch my ear as I remember there was blood. I grumbled as I saw some cloth on the table, grabbed a piece of tape, and taped the cloth over my ears. I shouldn't have done that because the cloth muffled the sound. I barely heard the sound of the door opening, and a bark after that. As I heard what sounded like barking I booked it for the bathroom again. As I closed the door behind me I heard the ripping of flesh and a screech that sounded like a customer. I grumbled as I took off my temporary bandage. Now I heard everything clearly. The barking stopped as I heard paw steps retreat, or what I thought were paws. Looked at my phone to realize that it was almost 6 o'clock a.m. I locked the door and headed towards the exit of the library, and I almost ran into James again. Whoa, um, Jacob be careful. I stifled a sigh as I remembered Rule 7. No wait James, what's Rule 7? James' face went white, and he stared at me. He took a breath to calm down. And nothing Jacob, I made a mistake and crossed it out. I looked at him and wondered. Then why didn't you change rule 8 to be 7? James looked at me, his eyes narrowing. Like I said Jacob, it's a mistake. Guys I need help. I don't know why James is being suspicious. What should I do? I don't know who to trust. Oh, if. Just remembered yesterday. He's the wolf from yesterday. The wolf from rule 4. Guys I really need your help. I feel like I'm going insane, and what does the wolf mean by trapped? It was walking right next to the door, and what is rule 7 James is acting weird? Then again I don't know who James is, did James trap those things in the library? I was sitting outside of the library looking at it, wondering what to do. I had a couple of matches in my pocket just in case. I looked around as I heard a rustle in the bushes low growling came from it. I grabbed the knife in my pocket and stepped out of my truck. Who's there? My voice was hard and cold. I looked into the bush and noticed lifeless eyes staring down at me. Hello human, you know what you must do. It was the wolf again, the creature from before. Well I don't know what you're talking about. Retorted, knowing what it wanted. You're lying to yourself, human. You always do, 
Even when the answer is right in front of you, the creature croaked. Wait, what do you mean I lie to myself all the time? My voice cracked as I finished. Humans always lie, even the person who trapped us here lied to you. The creature sounded sad. I looked at it confused. Wait, who imprisoned you? I looked at the creature as something began to laugh. The laughing became screaming. Close your eyes. I screamed and hoped the creature heard me. I heard a snap as the laughing came to a halt. I opened my eyes to see the creature standing over a mangled corpse of what looked like a customer. What is that thing? The creature looked up at me and scoffed. They're from a different dimension, but trapped here. And in your world it's called Rule 10. The creature finished. You sound like you hate the rules. Why is that? The creature looked at me. Its lifeless eyes narrowed in anger. You really don't know why I hate the rules. Its ears laid flat on its head. I hate the rules because they bound us to that place. They turn us into lifeless husks, rewriting our every move. The creature looked down at me and sighed. And I'm afraid that you're our only hope of escaping. I was about to speak when the creature began to quiver. Its eyes started to roll back into its head. It snapped its gaze to me and whimpered. Quick human, if you want to live go hide somewheres, before it overtakes me. I did as the creature said, and ran to hide inside a bush. I looked closely at the creature. And as I was watching the loud bark came from it, followed by many more. This creature was Rule 4. If this creature was the thing from Rule 4, that means there are others like it. Why was the creature acting like this? Wasn't it in control earlier? Then it all hit me. The rules are what forced the creatures to stay here. The rules control the creatures. But why would anybody want to control them? Turned around as I heard a twig snap. The wolf was trying to find me. It was sniffing me out. Grabbed a rock and threw it in a different direction. The rock made a loud bang as it hit my car. The creature snapped its neck in the direction of my car and began to claw at it furiously. Then I heard it. The library door opening and closing. It was a customer. I looked at the wolf as it charged for the door. The door splintered into pieces as the wolf came charging in. It grabbed the customer and pulled it outside. It screamed as the wolf began to bite. The customer wailed as the wolf went. The wolf ripped as he went limp. Turned away as the scent of copper came flooding into my nose. A familiar voice came ringing in my ears. Human, are you there? I turned around and looked at the wolf. The wolf looked around as it spoke. Human it's Hulk. after I killed the creature I changed back. I sighed as I walked out of the bush. I looked at the sky to see that it was becoming dawn. So what happened? The wolf seemed to grow larger as it looked down on me. Like I keep saying, humans, the person who trapped us here bound us to the building. And is controlling us with the rules. I looked up at the wolf. I was an idiot. Completely ignored the facts. I heard footsteps approaching. The wolf sniffed the air and ran into the woods. I noticed a dark figure standing outside of the woods. And as the sun began to rise, I saw that it was James. I was confused at what James was looking at. Turned around and saw that he was looking at where the wolf went. I waited until James was inside the building. I slowly walked out of the woods careful not to make a sound. I didn't want James to see me coming from the woods because he was acting weird. I opened the door to my now very broken truck. I found my key and started my engine. James looked through the window and looked at my truck. He watched me as I left the library. I was going down my street as I heard a whisper. Turned my head and saw lifeless eyes. Human, you must burn down the library before he has his grasp over this planet too. I stepped on my brakes and fully turned around. What do you mean wolf? The wolf narrowed its eyes and growled. Foolish human, why does it have to be you? Why do you have to be the one to save us? I looked at the wolf wondering why it couldn't burn the library. Wolf, 
Why can't you just do it? It looked at me. Well, human, since I'm bound to the library, I can't destroy it. And since you're not, you can. Looked up at the wolf's lifeless eyes. And why should I trust you, wolf? How do I know the library is protecting us? The wolf lashed its tail and barked. Because human, in a few days, the witch will get more and more power until he has enough to control this planet. And if you don't want to get controlled, I think you might want to burn it down. I sighed, closed my eyes, and took a few deep breaths. I opened my eyes again to see that the wolf disappeared. I felt a searing pain in my hand, and found that the scales on my hand were spreading. I yelled in pain as my eyes and legs were hurting as well. Everything began to hurt. The wolf was right. Whoever made the library was getting more powerful. I needed to stop them before they could control me. Drove to the library as fast as I could. Opened my door and slammed it shut. I saw a light flicker inside and saw James. I went into my pocket and grabbed my matches. The fire in my hands was bright. I threw the match at the wooden door and it began to burn. I went into the forest to grab some dead leaves, anything that was dry, and burn it. Was about to put a dead log into the burning building. But I couldn't move, my body trembled and stopped. I heard a familiar voice in my ears. Foolish boy, should have listened to the wolf. Soon I will have enough power to control everything. You shouldn't have listened to me. You shouldn't have got this job. You shouldn't have listened to Rule 7. Rule 7. Don't trust the person named James. There is no manager. Recently, my dad got a new job in a town about 50 miles away, so we had to move. I wasn't happy about it. None of us was, but it was a good job offer and my siblings and me were old enough to understand it. So I left my friends behind and started a new life in a town completely new to me. Well, I didn't exactly leave them behind. I could still see them at weekends or during the holidays, right? The neighborhood we moved in was really nothing special. The stereotypical Midwestern American suburbs, kids playing on the streets and nice houses on a symmetric street. I hadn't seen the house before. My parents did, but to me and siblings, it was entirely new. I took a first look at my room. It had a clean appearance and still some of the pre-owner's furniture. Guess they didn't need them anymore. To me, it was a good coincidence. I liked the mirror on my wall. It seemed pretty old though. Guess I'd polish it a bit to bring back its old glamour. Besides of that, my room was pretty basic. A bed under a window, light floating my room with a late summer's shine. On the ceiling, a fan and a bulb without cover. This kind of bothered me. I wanted a nice lamp so I decided to sit on my bed and look for one on the internet. After some minutes of searching, I found and ordered one. Just as mom called me, Adam, Adam, come downstairs and help us carry in our stuff. Closed the tab and walked down the stairs and out the door, grabbing the first box I saw. It read kitchen, so I went there. As I placed it on the ground, I noticed there was a note on the fridge. The pre-owners must have left it, probably informing us about a broken part that they didn't tell us before we bought it. But no, it was a list. A list of rules. I read it out loud. Always close and lock the basement door before dusk. If you see shadows in the living room after midnight, head into your room. They talk. Don't listen to them. Do N.O.T. follow their orders. Don't leave your room from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. If any of the tap starts running at night, turn on the main light in the room. Wait until it stops, then you can turn it off again. If you see anyone in the mirror in the upstairs first room on the right side, immediately cover it with a blanket. Don't uncover it before dawn. The mirror must not be moved under any circumstances. If a raven sits outside on your windowsill at night, close the blinds and hide under your blanket. 
The raven will poke on the glass. Wait till he stops. Don't open the blinds again in that night. If you hear glass breaking at night, turn on your main light and leave it on until dawn. Weird. Are they trying to prank us? They must be. Suddenly my dad came in the kitchen. He saw I was reading the note and stood beside me, also reading it. He chuckled, do they really think I'm falling for this? He ripped the note off the fridge and threw it in the trash can. Then he continued carrying in boxes. I wasn't surprised. My dad had always been very easy with such stuff. Neither was I. I was kind of superstitious to be honest. So I took the list out the trash can and stuffed it in my pocket. The afternoon went by pretty quick. We set up our stuff and got familiar with our new home. I told my older sister about the rules and asked her what she thought about it. She thought it was a prank too, but as I showed her the mirror in my room, the began thinking. Eventually she let out a relief sigh. Luckily it's not my room, she made a face at me and left. Great. My dad refused to lock the basement door, so I guess it was up to me to keep the family from trouble. If it even was trouble, perhaps it was a prank. Perhaps I was falling for it but I had seen enough horror movies about families moving into a new home to know. Better be safe than sorry. But for today, everything was perfectly alright. I spent the evening facetiming with my girlfriend Zoe, and around 1am we said goodnight. I missed her, we had been together for about a year now and I was kind of an overthinker so I spent the next minutes thinking. About us, about other guys in our hometown that may like her, what if she met one she liked too? Her boyfriend was far away, he wouldn't notice. Eventually I decided to stop thinking about it, and go to the bathroom, then sleep. Went on the toilet, washed my hands, brushed my teeth, my usual evening routine. Just as I was about to leave, I recognized the tap was running. Not much, just a few drops. But it wouldn't stop. Sure, it's an old house, about 40 years old, but I didn't want to take any risk so I took out the list and read it. I knew there was something about it. Indeed, there it was, rule number four. I reacted quickly, turned on the light and waited. Eventually the tap stopped running. Weird, was there really something about this list? I got curious, but on the other side, I didn't want to see what happened if I disobeyed the rules so I'd just leave it with it. I went back to my room and fell asleep pretty quickly. They say whatever you dream in your first night at a new place will come true. I didn't dream anything, or at least I don't remember. It was a tight, relaxing sleep. I woke up at around 9am, decided it had no purpose to try falling asleep again, so I went downstairs. It was long after dawn so I would unlock the basement door. Then I suddenly realized, what if I kept it locked all the time? Wouldn't that be easier? The rules said nothing about it, but I also didn't want to gamble. I unlocked the door and went in the kitchen to have breakfast but I couldn't eat much. Eventually my thoughts drifted away. What if I was not at home to lock the door someday? What if I broke a rule? What if one of my family members broke a rule? How long will we live here? Will I have to take care of everyone living here forever? Was it all really just a prank and I was going insane about it? It was mom who ended my thinking. She came in through the front door, placed her keys and some bags of groceries on the table, and told me to help her carry in the rest. Quickly put on my shoes and helped her, she handed me a big bag filled with ice cream, frozen fillets, peas and some other stuff. There's a large freezer in the basement. Can you put it there? She said. Her words sent chills down my spine. I didn't want to go into the basement but if I told her why, she'd probably drag me to see a therapist. Sure, no problem. I replied, grabbed the bag and went into the basement. It was dark, some bulbs were broken and the stairs creaked. I didn't want to spend more time than necessary down here. I didn't even know why the door should be locked at night. The freezer in the corner of the room seemed pretty old. We don't have one like that so I expected the pre-owners had left it here. Opened it and 
stood in shock for what felt like minutes. The freezer was filled with parts of human bodies, definitely from more than one person, cut off with what seemed like a saw and wrapped in plastic. I could see legs, arms, and even an eyeball. The parts were laying on a grid. Beneath it was a pool mixed of blood and water. The smell was horrible, stinging in my nose. Just as I stood there, my mind trying to process what I was seeing, the eyeball moved. It actually moved, now looking right at me, dead into my eyes. It even blinked at me, watching me with interest, awaiting my next action. My hands were so in shock that I dropped the bag. I felt a cold, icy wind blowing around me. I was in the basement. How was this possible? It was almost like I could hear someone whisper in the breeze. Eventually I turned around and ran up the stairs. I stumbled twice but I could keep myself going, as I was finally back in the foyer. Threw up on the ground, tears running down my face. Mom saw me and came up to me. Dear, are you alright? What happened? I didn't know it either, I still couldn't comprehend what I had just seen. I managed to point at the door with my index finger. My whole arm was shaking. Mom turned around. I heard her go down the stairs, open the freezer and scream. She was screaming in shock. She quickly went upstairs. By her look I could tell she was equally freaked out as me. Mom called the police. Then we waited. The two responding officers wanted us to show them what we found in the freezer. They seemed unnaturally calm for what we had just told them. When we opened the freezer, one officer held a cloth before his nose. The other, older one, didn't seem to care. He told us there had been an incident in this house some years ago. What we found in the freezer simply were evidences they had forgotten to collect. Forgotten. How can you forget a freezer full of parts of human bodies? However, the officers told us they'd send someone to get them then left shortly after so we were home alone again with a freezer full of bodies. Dad was at our old home, doing some paperwork and getting the remaining boxes of our stuff. My sister was at the mall, she had already made friends in this town. I spent some hours in my room, streaming shows and texting with Zoe. I could tell she was worried and so was I. I couldn't stop thinking about the things I had seen in the freezer. The older officer said there had been an incident at our house. What did the mean? Simply googled our address and instantly found some newspaper articles. Apparently a murderer used to live in this house. He would kidnap his victims, then slowly get rid of them in the basement, and also eat them. I nearly threw up again while reading the article. I had to get a clear mind, put on my shoes and a hoodie, and headed outside for a walk. The air was fresh and I could feel it clean my mind. For a brief moment I felt relieved, my head finally empty. But it didn't last long, just until I reached the end of the street and realized I had to go back into the psycho cannibal house. Now I had no doubts anymore. The list of rules wasn't a prank. It was a guide to surviving whatever was haunting this house. Back at home, I saw mom arguing with dad. They were yelling at each other. The topic obviously was the freezer in the basement and the house dad had bought. How could you let your family move to such a terrifying place? Mom yelled. Dad was about to answer when he recognized me coming in. Hey Adam, where have you been? Outside. I replied. Then I asked him, will you lock the basement door now? I could tell he was confused. What do you mean? Why should I? There's no. I'm sure the list was there for a reason. I interrupted him. Mom and me looked at dad now. You're crazy. I didn't think you'd fall for such a weak prank dad said. Prank. Come on, you know it's not a prank. Mom shouted at him. They began arguing again while I headed up to my room. I knew it was no prank, I had seen the eyeball stare at me with its pale, waiting look. As I arrived in my room, I noticed the mirror wasn't there. He wasn't in my room, he had been moved. It wasn't me, I knew the rules, it had to be one of my parents. I ran down the stairs, 
bumping into my still arguing parents, interrupted them with a cracking, have you moved the mirror in my room? They looked at me, irritated. Mom began to speak calmly. Yes, dear, I took it in the garage because I thought you wouldn't wa. I didn't hear the last part. I hurried to the garage. I had to get the mirror, shit, shit, shit. Rule 6, the mirror must not be moved under any circumstances. I was totally freaked out, looking for the mirror in the garage, throwing boxes around and dropping dad's tools all over the place. It wasn't there, just as I went outside the garage again, heading for the main door of the house. Saw something that would cause my stomach to hurt. Realized the sun was setting. I was frightened when I entered the house again. My parents had calmed down. Dad was sitting at the kitchen table. Mom was cooking dinner. Said that I didn't find the mirror in the garage. Mom simply replied, we'll look for it together tomorrow, all right. I nodded. I wasn't in the mood to eat something so I just went up to my room, streamed shows on my TV, until I fell asleep. But I didn't sleep long, at around 2.50 am I woke up, the TV screen was static and I felt strange. It was strange. My room was unnaturally cold, I was shivering, then I noticed it. The mirror was back on my wall, right where I found it when we moved in. I was curious, had mom put it back here? Why should she, she said we'd look for it together. While I was thinking, I recognized a quick movement in the mirror. Just for a short glimpse, my hackles raised. What had I just seen? Stood up and moved closer to the mirror. Now standing right in front of it. For a while, there was nothing. I just stood there, alone in my room lighted up from the static screen and the bright moon shining in. But then I saw it, and up to this day, I can't tell what it was. It seemed humanoid, but it wasn't a human. It was several humans. The body parts in the freezer, mixed together into one creature, moving on two legs with additional extremities all over its body. Hands, arms, legs, feet stood out all over it. Like I saw it in the freezer, some parts were beginning to rot. Others seemed pretty untouched. I viewed its entire appearance, taking a step back when I suddenly realized it. The eye, the eyeball that watched me. It was right there, in the middle of its head, if you can even call it head. It was a lump of flesh with the eyeball in its very center, staring at me with the same waiting look it had in the freezer when I first saw it. It was so cold I could see my breath. My mind was nearly crashing. What was I seeing? Before I could start to really think about it, I noticed it moving. It seemed to come closer. In the same moment the whispering started again. I could hear several people talking. They were saying entire sentences, but I could only understand some words. More sacrifice, mistake. I stood in shock, not knowing what I should do now, until I remembered the rules. I quickly pulled my blanket off the bed and covered the mirror with it. The whispering stopped immediately, and I let out a relief sigh. Sat on my bed. My head felt hot. My mind was racing. Again, my thinking was interrupted. The static on the TV screen had stopped and you won't believe me what I saw. The creature, the same I had seen in the mirror just seconds ago, now on the TV. Now I could understand the whole sentence that was coming out the speakers. Don't try to escape, Adam. I quickly turned the TV off and pulled the plug. I had to calm down. Left my room and headed for the kitchen to get some water. As I came down the stairs I saw my little brother in the living room, staring at the wall. Confused I asked him, Jacob, what are you doing? He didn't turn around when he answered. They want me to play with them. They, what was he talking about? Oh shit. I realized what he was staring at. Shadows. All over the wall there were dark shadows. They were moving, dancing, it was almost hypnotizing. I jumped down the last stairs and ran to Jacob, grabbing him by the shoulder and pulling him away from the wall. Now I could hear the shadows too. 
Their voices were the same as the ones I had heard in the basement and in my room. Were they, were they the souls of the former people? I didn't think about it for long, just pushing my brother out of the room, towards the stairs. K. Jacob, go to your room and sleep, but Adam, Sha, do what I told you. He went upstairs but stopped several times, looking back to me. I signalized him to continue walking and waited till I heard the door of his room shut. This was crazy, when I came back into the living room the shadows were gone, nothing, just our living room. It was almost like I could have only dreamed that, but I knew it wasn't a dream. I knew what I had seen, and it freaked me out. There definitely was more to this house than the officers, pre-owners and my dad told us. I went into the kitchen to get a glass of water, thinking as I stood by the sink. Why was my dad acting like it all was a prank? It obviously wasn't. Did he, did he know what happened in this house? You see, my family never had a huge load of money. Moving in this quite big house seemed odd. Unless, unless it was cheaper because of its history, because of the things that had happened here, because it was haunted. My thoughts drifted away. I looked around the room, the table, the oven, the clock, the clock. It read 2.58 a.m. chills ran down my spine. I remembered the third rule. Don't leave your room from 3 a.m. to 4 a.m. That's it. I had enough. I wanted to go to my room quickly and sleep. Forget about all this until morning. Then confront dad with all the things I had seen in this haunted house. Went out the kitchen and up the stairs straight into my room and closed the door behind me. My room was almost completely dark, only the light of the moon supplying it with a beam of light. My blanket was still over the mirror, but luckily I had another one on my sofa. The room wasn't as cold as it was when I woke up. Another weird thing I'd think about tomorrow. I grabbed my phone and checked who of my friends was still up. Thank God Nick, my best friend, was. Explained the situation to him and told him everything that had happened. Luckily, he believed me, it was good to have someone who didn't ignore you. I spent the next hour texting with him until I eventually fell asleep again. I woke up in the late forenoon, sunshine glimmering in my room, letting particles of dust dance in its light. It was so peaceful, I could hear the chirping of birds and cheerful screams of kids playing outside. I got up and uncovered the mirror, throwing the blanket back on my bed. Then I had a quick look into it. Nothing. Just me. I seemed a bit tired. Not from a lack of sleep but from a lack of peace. The past days had been horrible. That's definitely not the kind of welcome gift you want to have. Went downstairs and unlocked the basement door. Then I went into the kitchen, preparing myself to confront Dad. But he wasn't there. None of my family members was there. Except my little brother. Hey Jacob, I said, where are the others? He looked up from the bowl of cereal he was eating and told me, Lucy is with some friends, she'll probably stay overnight. And mom and dad, shopping. All right then. I muttered, also grabbing a bowl and filling it with cereal and milk. I sat across my brother and began to eat. Adam, Jacob suddenly asked, was the only response I managed to give him. Jacob only poked around in his bowl. He looked concerned. I quickly swallowed and asked him, what's wrong? I had a strange dream last night. I dreamed I was in the living room and there were shadows on the wall, and they talked to me. Just sat in silence for a moment. How should I react to that? Couldn't tell him it wasn't a dream and the shadows had actually been there. He was just a kid, he would totally lose it. So I simply replied, don't worry, it was only a dream, but it wasn't. The shadows were real, the whispering was real, and this creature was real too. I began thinking about it. Would it stop to haunt this house if the police collected the bodies in the freezer? When would they come to collect it? Would they even come? It's been almost a day now, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't take long to radio for someone who picks them up. We lived in a quite boring area. 
The incident in this house was the most exciting thing in 20 years. Murders didn't happen every day here, so yes, I'm convinced they should have come already. After we finished breakfast, I put the bowls in the dishwasher and headed back into my room. I hadn't much to do, so I would finish the show I was streaming and maybe look for a new one. Holidays really are boring if you don't have anyone to spend time with. I had no one in this town. My friends, my girlfriend, everyone except my family was 50 miles away. The only way I could communicate with them was texting or face to me. At least something. Imagine I had lived 100 years ago. I would have had to write letters and wait days for an answer. I definitely preferred the modern world. The day went by pretty fast. Mom and Dad came back at around 3 p.m. They had bought some pillows and a new closet for their bedroom. I helped Dad carry it in. As we sat on the bed in my parents' room, I told Dad how the mirror had suddenly been back in my room and what I saw in it, and on the TV. I also told him about Jacob standing in the living room, staring at the shadows, and how he now believed it was a dream. Dad still didn't seem to care. Well, why do you think it wasn't a dream? He asked me. Because I saw it too, and the monster in the mirror and on the TV. Why won't you believe me? There is no such thing as ghosts or monsters. I didn't think I'd have to tell that a 16-year-old. You're simply missing home and aren't familiar with this new house yet. Did you know about the murders that happened here? Quickly asked him Dad seemed surprised, but he answered calmly. I'm not gonna lie to you, Adam. Yes, I knew it and I didn't tell you all about it, because I knew it would freak you out, just like it does now. You let us live in a murderer's house and believe the crazy shit going on here doesn't have anything to do with it. Adam, there's no crazy shit going on here, I told you before. His voice turned louder. Mix of disappointment and anger, probably more anger. It had no purpose talking to him. He would stay stubborn, not letting anyone criticize the perfect house he had bought. I left the room and went downstairs where I ran into my mom. She seemed to get ready for something. Are you going out? I asked her. Yes, dear, your father and me have been invited by the Johnsons, the couple that lives down the street. We would have taken you with us, but they'd rather get to know only us at first. Sorry, Adam. She gave me a quick kiss on the cheek and told Dad to come downstairs. As they went outside the door, Mom told me, We will be back some time after midnight. There's chicken in the fridge. Bye, sweetie. The door closed, and I was home alone with my brother and whatever else was in here. Jacob and I watched some TV in the living room. Well, he was watching. I spent most of the time texting. Eventually, he said he was tired and went upstairs. I made sure he closed the door behind him. It was now 11.30 p.m. and my hunger kicked in. I went into the kitchen to get the chicken mom had told me about, put it in the microwave, waited. After pressing the button exactly one second before the shrill ping sound, I took the chicken out the microwave, got a drink and headed back into the living room. After setting down, excited to enjoy my meal. I perceived a noise which would send chills down my spine immediately. The sound of a glass breaking, coming from the kitchen. I stood up fast. I wanted to investigate the sound so I turned on the light in the kitchen. But I saw no glass, nowhere. For a brief moment I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, thinking I had been so exhausted from the past days that my senses weren't working well anymore. This short moment of doubt ended as I heard another noise behind me. No breaking glass, no noise you'd expect to hear if you're home alone and definitely no noise you'd want to hear if you're home alone. The growling, right behind me. I stood in shock, the noise seemed close, but not too close. Slowly turned around, hoping for the best, maybe a stray dog who entered our house through an open door. But I expected the worst. And as I saw it, my worst expectation turned out to be true. It was the creature I had seen in the mirror, the familiar eyeball watching me. 
I had forgotten to lock the basement door. I stood in shock, facing the creature. Watched it and it watched me back, the same look I was so familiar with. A look of no soul, and many souls. The eye didn't move, it just stared at me, interested, interested in me. I was curious too, but not in a good way. Chills ran down my spine, and I didn't move, it was almost like I had forgotten how to move. This creature, this monster had a certain flair, something I had never experienced before. I was banned by its look. Then suddenly, the eye blinked and in that very short glimpse, suddenly, everything came back to me. Realized where I was standing, and what I was facing. Eventually, my fight or flight instinct kicked in. This thing was taller than me, almost reaching the kitchen light way up on the ceiling. And it definitely was stronger too, so it was the flight reflex that caused me to turn around, not knowing where I was going except of away. Away from the bodies in the freezer, the creature in the mirror and also the monster that would haunt me in my dreams from now on. As I was running through the house, heading for the main door, I could hear it follow me. It made big steps, slightly shaking the floor, and that sound it made. It was a crazy mix. A mix of dread, despair and devastating anger. Like a thousand souls crying for help and hunting me like a wild animal in the same moment. I heard it catch up to me. My body was filled with adrenaline. When I finally reached the door, I pulled it open quickly and sort of fell out onto the ground. With my right foot, I kicked the door and it closed. I stood up as fast as I could, prepared to run again, but it didn't seem to follow me. Apparently the door was the edge of its universe. The growling and mix of sounds ended too, but I didn't want to enter the house again. I knew it was waiting for me. Don't be afraid, Adam. A calm voice said behind me. I immediately turned around, now facing a man dressed in a suit made of black tweed and a long coat. He was wearing a hat too. The man looked like he was in his late forties, and he seemed so unnaturally calm and relaxed that I was confused for a moment. Who are you? I asked him as I got my mind together. That does not matter, Adam. He responded. Why do you know my name? I know a lot of things, Adam. Some people would even describe me as omniscient. He chuckled. See, Adam, why don't you sit down with me? He sat down on the curbstone by the street. I approached him a bit but didn't sat next to him. He was like the exact opposite of the creature hunting me. So nice, so calm, so polite. Adam, he began talking again. You see, the monster that is after you is equally afraid as you. They don't know what to do. They are captured and believe they will never be able to escape. And so they want more, more to be with them, to spend eternity together, to suffer together. They. I asked him, who is this thing? The man smiled at me. All of us, and none of us. I don't understand. I replied, you don't need to understand. There are a lot of things in this world that you don't understand. But you also don't have to be afraid. What is your biggest fear? Probably death. Well, not death itself, but the uncertainty what comes after it. And I understand you. Who knows what comes after death? Whom he gave me a thinking look, raising his eyebrow. Then he smiled again, I probably. But what does that have to do with this creature? Nothing, and everything. But, I turned around to watch the house again. It was exactly how I left it. But what is the... As I turned around again, the man was gone. No trace of him, nothing. I was confused as never before in my life. My mind was crashing. It was like one of those Dadamosh memes. But it's not as fun if you experience it yourself. The burn in your brain. The stinging in both temples and cold sweat covering your entire body. I knew I had to enter the house again even though I didn't want to. But I had to get in there. I couldn't sleep on the street or wake up the neighbors. Besides of that, my parents would be back in a while, wondering how me and my brother were doing. My brother. 
I tore the door open again, and had a quick look inside. No monster, just our usual house. Slowly went back inside, still anxious but also worrying about Jacob. As I came into the kitchen, there was still no sight of the glass I heard breaking before. It was perfectly silent and clean. I went up the stairs fast and opened the door of my brother's room. He was asleep, his sleep seemed pretty tight. I didn't want to bother him so I went into my room to calm down. I closed the door and switched the light on. It were only a few steps to my bed, but I didn't make it. As I was halfway there, I heard the growling again, now coming from directly behind me, just inches away. I knew what it was and I also knew I couldn't escape, and the creature knew it too. It was standing right between me and the door. So I turned around. I felt like I could see a hint of satisfaction in its blank, pale eye that was watching me just like before. But before I could say something, or even had the chance to make a move, the monster reached for me, grabbing my neck with the dead, half-rotten arms that were standing out of its torso. It choked me now tried to fight as best as I could but I didn't stand a chance. It was just too strong. Then it threw me on my bed, letting me breathe for a second, like it wanted me to survive, at least for a moment. It crawled over me and continued to choke me, also grabbing my arms so I couldn't resist. At this moment I was sure I would die in this night, but somehow I managed to loosen its grip around my neck. I remembered what the man out on the street had told me and bursted out a single sentence. I understand you. My voice was low. I was out of breath and also didn't get an opportunity to catch it. The creature seemed even more furious now. It choked me even harder and let out a loud, demonic roar. The sound was deep but I could comprehend what it was saying. Liar. How was it even able to speak? It had no mouth. Over and over again, the monster would yell, liar, at me, angry and whimpering at the same time while choking me harder as ever before. At this moment, I was entirely sure there was no hope left, but then, I heard the sound of the front door of our house open, and a creature letting out a penetrating, deep screech. The last thing I heard before passing out, woke up in hospital, it was a fresh morning, and I witnessed birds chirp through the open window. Mom was sitting by my bed. I could tell she hadn't left me since I had been brought here. Felt relieved, relieved as never before in my life. Had not died, and that was the only thing that mattered. The next days went by pretty fast. The doctors were still concerned and had no way to explain my physical condition. Besides of the obvious marks on my neck, also had frostbites all over my body. I didn't realize them myself until the doctors pointed it out, and had also no way of explaining how I got them, except from the attack, but in that moment, I didn't feel anything. There are still a lot of things I think about in any free second. My experiences in the horror house, the monster itself, but also the strange polite man I met on the street. I will be released from hospital tomorrow, and one thing is sure, I won't go back into that house ever again. I also talked that uh, with my parents, I'll move to Zoe, back in my old hometown. As far as I know, Dad had already made plans to sell the house and of cows he would leave a note of rules for the next owners.